I just want to say up front, Persona 5 has been perhaps one of the most impactful pieces of media in my life. I just absolutely loved every second of my over 140 plus hours invested that it took to get to the credits. The characters, the setting, the dazzling style. For Pete's sake, I've got the songs on loop right now in my Spotify. But beyond that, there was something special about this game beyond its technical achievements. For me, it was all about its themes and how they impacted me on a deeply personal level. This is Sad Guy Hours, and today I'll be talking for way too long about how Persona 5 changed my life. Persona 5 has multiple themes present in the foreground and background of its narrative. The series is absolutely full of symbolism. One can find elements of themes everywhere you look, from the musical arrangement, to the aesthetics, all the way to the gameplay mechanics. And while I'd say every confidant and palace in the game has its own distinct theme and social commentary attached to them, there are a few major reoccurring ones that stuck out to me in a profound way. These being authority, rebellion, justice, and freedom illustrated through change. All through the lens of Jungian psychology. Yes, even though I said major, that is quite a few. And before I give my interpretation of these themes and how they were implemented, I just want to say that I am by no means an expert in thematic or literary analysis. There are so many fantastic videos on YouTube that will do a much more exhaustive job on this section of the video, which I encourage you to look up. I merely really, really like this game and wanted to talk about it and how it impacted me. So without further ado, we will start the analysis portion. While looking at the themes of Persona, one must be aware of the context in which it was produced, as well as the authorial intent behind its production. Persona is unashamedly and quite deliberately an examination and critique of the current Japanese socio-cultural state. This is important to highlight due to the dramatic differences of values between Eastern thought compared to a Western thought context. For example, in the West, the individual and his or her personal freedom is given top priority, as seen in our emphasis on rights, self-expression, and a facts-based justice system. While in the East, conformity to the collective is given top priority, as seen in their emphasis on a unified identity, strict hierarchy, and their shame-honor social systems. This is important to point out because this social backdrop really illustrates the countercultural nature of many of Persona's key themes that we may not find unusual in the West. The first theme I'll talk about is really more of a lens in which the other themes ought to be viewed through, and that is of Jungian psychology. Persona wears its influence of the psychologist Carl Jung on its sleeve, or better put, displays it in neon lights. A couple of themes taken from Jung's theory which play a heavy role are shadows, personas, individuation, and archetypes. According to Jung, every person has both a shadow and a persona. The shadow is an unconscious aspect of the personality that the conscious ego does not identify in itself, usually being one's own irrationality and moral deficiency. Basically, it's the part of you which you do not acknowledge, which tends to be negative things like inferiority, envy, hatred, you name it. In Persona 5, you fight the shadows of corrupted adults in order to steal their desires. This translating to you performing a sort of psychological surgery in which you remove the cause of the shadow's existence. 
For example, the arrogant pedophilic gym teacher Kamoshida thought he was untouchable and superior to everyone else. And the reason he thought this was because he had earned an Olympic medal. So when the Phantom Thieves entered his cognitive palace, a physical manifestation of a person's heart or mind, it was a castle in which his shadow was a king. This is because that was how he unconsciously perceived himself. When the Phantom Thieves steal his desires, really what they're doing is changing his cognition around the Olympic medal, which was the catalyst for his descent into moral depravity. Without that original cause motivating his gross superiority complex, all that's left is the weight of the consciousness for his crimes, with none of the depravity remaining. And so, with all that guilt and none of the shadow remaining, Kamoshida and other criminals who've had their desire stolen by the Phantom Thieves will often turn themselves in to the police, thus securing some sort of retributive justice. Did the volleyball team do something? I have repeatedly done things that were unbecoming of a teacher, verbally abusing students, physically abusing my team, and sexually harassing female students. I am the reason why Shiho Suzui tried to kill herself. Sexual harassment? What? Why would he oh, say that himself? Uh, he is the so team? worst. Really? Physical abuse? I thought of the school as my own castle. There were even students that I sentenced to expulsion simply because I didn't like them. I will, of course, rescind those. I am truly sorry for putting innocent youths through such horrible acts. I am an arrogant, shallow, and shameful person. No, I'm worse than that. I will take responsibility. I kill myself for it. What? Did he just say that? Did we kill himself? Don't run, you bastard! Shiho's still alive, even after all the things that made her want to die! You have no right to run from this! You're right. You're absolutely right. I should be punished under the law and atone for my crimes. So the rumors weren't true. As of today, I will resign from my position as an instructor and turn myself in. Someone please call the police! The police? Is he for real? But other than a shadow, everyone also contains, or better put, portrays a persona, the game's namesake. It is the social face the individual presents to the world, a kind of mask designed on the one hand to make a definite impression upon others, and on the other to conceal the true nature of the individual. This is the self you try and be on a first date, or at school, or really any other place in which you are not totally secure. The difference with the shadow is that the persona can change based on who you're interacting with. Perhaps you allow yourself to be more goofy with the boys, but are super serious around teachers. Usually, personas are an exaggerated front that the individual puts on based on what they are perceived to be, what they perceive to be the best identity in a given situation. In Persona, the game, personas are the primary weapons used by the protagonist and friends to fight against shadows. Sort of how people put on a persona in real life to fend off anxiety and fear, so do the Phantom Thieves use their personas to defend themselves from real danger. However, the interesting thing is that personas are summoned in the game only through the act of self-acceptance of one's own shadow and by tearing off the metaphorical and literal mask that each character has been forced to wear. This dramatic process leads to the next two terms, disintegration and restoration. 
Disintegration is the process of breaking down one's own persona to allow for the growth of the individual, also known as individuation. This is followed by an understandable time of inner chaos and confusion. Discarding one's established identity takes immense courage and moral fortitude. When one's coping mechanisms and security is broken, coming to terms with reality is terrifying. This is brilliantly portrayed in the awakening scenes of Persona. Each of the characters comes to the point where they tear the mask off that they had been wearing, their role in life and choose to face reality with open eyes. For example, one of the Phantom Thieves, Makoto, has been leading a life of an ideal Japanese teen. Student council president, perfect grades, avoiding trouble, and following her authority figures with orders without question. However, deep down, she hated following a life that others decided for her. She despised her inability to help people by simply being another cog in a corrupt machine. So she rejected her role as a model student, her persona, and instead chose the path of freedom and rebellion. Have you decided to tread the path of strength? Yes. Come to me! Very well. Let us proceed with our contract at once. I am thou. Thou art I. You have finally found your own justice. Please, never lose sight of it again. This memorable day marks your graduation from your false self. What the hell? Not lose heart again. Ever. I'll go full speed, non-stop. Right, Johanna? The next step is then restoration. This is the goal of individuation. That being to develop a more realistic, flexible persona that helps them navigate in society, but does not collide with nor hide their true self. Eventually, in the best case, the persona is appropriate and tasteful, a true reflection of one's inner individuality and outward sense of self. This is shown in Persona 5 Royal fantastically in the means of the Phantom Thieves' final persona evolutions. After facing their weakness, tearing off their false mask, striving through the chaos of growing as an individual, and finally choosing a purpose in which to follow in their life, only then are their personas giving their true form. Again, to use Makoto's example, by finally choosing her own path, she eventually comes to terms with what her own ideals are. She decides to go against the hierarchy and pursue a male-dominated job, that of a police commissioner. She does this to uphold the ideals she has found to be most important, that of justice. She thus completes her process of individuation, from confronting her shadow, her feelings of incompetence, to dismantling her persona as the ideal student, to reforming her sense of self to what she truly believes in, and reconstructing a more true persona. The final aspect of Jung I'll touch on is the integral emphasis on archetypes. While Persona doesn't use the term explicitly, they instead choose to represent the archetypes through the major arcana of the tarot deck, which each confidant, the people you bond with throughout the game, are identified with. Each of the characters you bond with in the game can be represented by an overarching archetype. For example, Morgana of the Magician Arcana plays the role of the mystic teacher who guides the protagonist at the start of the journey. This is the Merlin, or the Gandalf. In my opinion, these neatly pair well with the idea of the hero's journey, with the protagonist starting as the fool, the untested man marked by lack of experience, and ending with obtaining the world, or a completion of his soul through wisdom. This is just such a genius way of driving home the message on the importance of human bonds and the development of one's life. 
It is through these bonds that one discovers the path to true self-understanding. It's even represented in the gameplay mechanics, because the stronger your bonds, the stronger you become. But enough about Jung, let's discuss the more plot-relevant themes. The idea of rebellion is central to the plot, motivations, and aesthetics of the main cast. All of them have faced an unjust circumstance due to no fault of their own, and were told to simply accept it. But instead of laying in misery, they raise a flag of defiance and seek to get the justice that was denied them. For the hot-headed Ryuji, he was physically abused by an egotistical teacher and had his dreams stolen from him in the way of a broken leg, social ostracism, and the disbandment of the track team. For the lovably awkward Yusuke, it was a manipulative mentor who exploited his talents for personal gain and who robbed him of a life with his mother. Through arduous pressure, they accept the reality of their life circumstances and choose to rebel against such injustice. The Phantom Thieves' appearances are all made up of their own specific view of what rebellion looks like, and so their cognition makes manifest the newfound rebellion found within them. Their resolve is given a tangible form, both in clothing as well as in the shape of their persona going forth. You made me wait quite a while. <laughs> You seek power, correct? Then let us form a pact. Since your name has been disgraced already, why not hoist the flag and wreak havoc? The other you who exists within desires it thus. I am thou, thou art I. There is no turning back. The skull of rebellion is your flag henceforth! <laughs> what can you do? Cower in fear and watch! No, this is a well. Right on. What's up, Persona? This effin' rocks! Now that I got this power, it's time for payback! Yo, I'm ready! Bring it! Don't mock me, you brat! Blast him away, Captain Kid! This theme of rebellion is contrasted against that of the main antagonistic force of the game, that being disordered authority. This is a theme I strongly connect with, as I'm sure many can in our current times. The idea of twisted and corrupt leaders getting away with all manner of sin and oppression is just unbelievably irritating, even to a peaceful man like myself. Outright exploitation, censorship, mass propagandized lies, sexual scandals, traffic in rings, senseless war, and yet nothing happens. Those in power simply get away with it. The sense of justice burns in my heart at the state of the world, though I know it's always been this way. I love how Persona does not shy away from the sickening reality of such crimes, though I won't spoil here. However, I think it's appropriate to mention again how we ought to consider the Japanese context to better understand just how far this theme goes. A founding principle for Western society is Blackstone's ratio, which states that it is better for 10 guilty men to go free than one innocent man to suffer under false charges. Now, the exact ratio doesn't really matter but it's the principle for our justice system which is constructed the ethic innocent until proven guilty. But this is simply not the case in Japan. Instead, the prosecution success rate in Japan is around 99.3%. This impossibly high number is due to unethical practices which are accepted 
such as the expectation to get a confession out of the accused no matter what. This leads to potentially innocent people being locked away in isolation for up to 23 days, no cameras, no lawyers, before charges are even filed. It is well documented that during this time, police will take shifts tormenting individuals physically and psychologically until they receive a confession of guilt, even if it's false. Prosecutors will simply not take someone to court that they don't have absolute certainty that they can get a conviction out of. This means people of power and influence hardly ever go to court, while those of lower status have virtually no chance of escape. This is exactly what happens in the case of the Persona's protagonist, Joker. Many innocent people have been broken and betrayed by the Japanese judicial system in order to maintain the status quo. And many truly vile criminals will never face the courtroom at all. The very system which is supposed to be the executors of true justice are yet another corrupt authority figure. But back to the particular authority figures in which you rebel against over the course of the game. I love how they humanize these otherwise monstrous people. It almost makes you feel pity when you finally defeat their shadows, their twisted, distorted selves, because you realize that they too were afraid to behold just how messed up they really were. You realize that they are stunted individuals who never went through the agonizing process of disintegration and restoration. And so, they became puppets to their own deficiencies, husks who refused to change. It's sobering because you realize that you could be them if you too refused to change. Later on in the story also highlights how taking down a corrupt individual can help and even save many lives. But in the grand scheme of things, it does nothing in the face of the whole spread societal issues which enables such people to begin with. There's even more that could be said about how Persona tackles the idea of authority from asking the question of by what authority do the Phantom Thieves enact the rebellion to how much does popular opinion lend legitimacy or not to authority. But I'll leave it there for now. The last theme I will talk about is perhaps the most central message of Persona to me, as well as a culmination of all the other ones and that is the necessity of change and how it is the path to true freedom. This change is illustrated through the Jungian process of individuation. The archetypes presented in the Arcana Confidence are like steps or lessons the protagonist must take in order to complete his own restoration. Starting with the Fool, which represents new beginnings and naive ignorance, and ending with obtaining the world. the final arcana, the world representing the world's totality, the symbol of fulfillment, wholeness, and harmony. One could see this individuation with the help of archetypical figures as a sort of allusion to the hero's journey, but more like a human's path to true maturity. The process of individuation is like leaving your unsteady order to temporarily embrace chaos. That is the essence of change. Chaos is by nature unstable, uncertain, unsustainable. And that is why change is so frightening, especially when you are dealing with your core conception of self. But it is necessary to delve into that chaos in order to return to a more stable state of order. Deconstructing your deficient frame for a stronger one I think that may be in part what the Bible means that one must die to self, crucifying the old to be born again in Christ. The hardest step in the hero's journey is debatably the descent into the underworld in search of the elixir of life, the leap of faith, the gazing into the abyss so that you might find light on the other side, leaving you transformed. In Persona 5, each of the Phantom Thieves must go through this process, starting with their awakening and finishing with their final Persona transformation 
after the regained resolve in the face of Maruki's alternative reality. But Persona doesn't just comment on individual change, but also tackles this on a societal level through the Jungian concept of the collective unconscious. The Phantom Thieves delve into the underworld, known as mementos, the combined psyche of humanity. They do so in order to obtain the metaphorical elixir of life, that of the Holy Grail, this being the distorted desires of humanity. When delving into the depths, they come face to face with the manifestation of stagnation, or the collective shadow of mankind, the false god of control, Yaldabaoth. He is the very antithesis of change. His goal is to strip humanity of free will since they do not use it well. He is the very representation of humanity's fear of changing. The Phantom Thieves overcome the power of this stagnant order, defeating the primordial temptation, and so freeing humanity's will, allowing change and growth to occur once again. Although as a Christian, I do not like glorifying depictions of Satan, I cannot argue that Joker's final persona of Sentinel is not absolutely fitting for being the archetypical representation of humanity's rebellion. Truly, there is no better figure to portray rebellion than that of the original rebel. I do love the paradoxical nature of proper rebellion as portrayed by Persona. Though portrayed as a demon, as a criminal, the rebellion that the Phantom Thieves live out is actually rooted in the good, a return to how things ought to be, a proper order free from distortion. It's far from senseless anarchy, and that's an important distinction. No justice comes from senseless destruction. Proper rebellion must be directed towards a re-establishment of order. As a Christian, I can appreciate the emphasis on the necessity of preserving the human will and rejecting nihilistic stagnation. It is that very will, which is, in part, what the Bible means by God making us in his image. Without a will, we are nothing, mere objects devoid of life. One could say the Phantom Thieves journeyed into the underworld, and in overcoming it, they themselves were transformed. And not just themselves, but they claimed the elixir of life, quite literally in this case, I think, and so transformed the community. Though this resolve is tested to the fullest extent when Maruki gains control of humanity's collective cognition and creates an ideal reality free of pain for not just the Phantom Thieves, but eventually the whole world. On the surface, this new reality seems very tempting. So much so that I see people still talking about how Maruki was right in doing this. But through collective reflection, the Phantom Thieves realized that a life free from their pain meant they reverted back to their old selves, stripping their growth. They realized that what they gained through overcoming hardship was far greater than a facade of security. Greater understanding of self, discovery of values they most cherish, strengthening of character, friendship, and new opportunities. It is better to be brave than safe, to overcome than avoid hardship. It is only in conquering our fear, or as Persona 3 puts it, burning our dread, that we can live life to its fullest. That is why I think Maruki's theme, Throw Away Your Mask, in conjunction with the Phantom Thieves' answer in I Believe, is a masterpiece in thematic storytelling through music. I highly encourage you to give both a full listen, and while you're at it, just play the game if you haven't. We've come this far! We ain't gonna give up! Yeah! You gotta do way better than this! Don't underestimate our tenacity! 
It's just another threat. We'll overcome it like we always do. If I run now, I know I'll regret it. We'll decide for ourselves what we want our lives to be. I'm a bit occupied, so do your goddamn job! Oracle, how does it look? Perfect! His head's defense level has dropped down to zero percent! Go for it! Finish this, Joker! The last thing I wanted to mention in this section is how magnificent the soundtrack you listen to for 100 plus hours backs up these themes. Jazz is a loosely defined style that emphasizes individuality coming together in spontaneous harmony, constantly shifting and evolving, often incorporating call and response rhythm, perfect for reflecting the central theme of persona. Even more so, the origin of jazz, to put it reductively, is rooted in the experience of the African slaves finding their identity in a strange new land. Its history tells a sprawling, complex tale which shows their spirituality, suffering, celebrations, and eventual newfound freedom, and so much more. Though it didn't just stay in America, it interestingly spread overseas to many other countries, even to Japan in the 70s. A musical genre that harmonizes well with the thoughts of rebellion, authority, and finding and changing your identity, as well as freedom. Give a couple of these tracks a listen. They are amazing. I've been waiting for this.
With that analysis portion out of the way, now I'll talk about myself for a bit and the impact such themes had in my own life. When I played Persona 5, it felt like staring into a mirror. Though the shape was wildly different as I live in America and have no magical metaverse powers, but the image was strikingly similar in some ways to my own life. My background is one that most would covet. I was raised by two loving and responsible parents who only wanted the best for me. They took care of my needs and I hardly knew what want or loss even felt like. Virtues such as truth, justice, temperance, self-control, and seeking wisdom were instilled into me from the very beginning. In addition to my parents, I had a fantastic older brother who was an inspiring role model for me to aspire towards. As a youth, truth and justice were unbreakable pillars that I held to. I would never lie or cheat, which remains true to this day. But at the time, I did not really have a justification for it. I just knew it was the right thing to do. That lack of motivation changed when I was in eighth grade, and I came into my faith as a Christian. It was through discovering the faith that the source of my ephemeral convictions took solid form. Now I knew why truth and justice mattered, and nothing would hinder my pursuit of them. I was in my high school years when I started truly examining the world for what it was. And quite frankly, it was ugly. I hated the corruption I saw. The politicians who only say lofty promises for a paycheck. Two pastors who are supposed to represent God, yet have adulterous affairs. I despised those in authority for their lack of integrity. I lamented the greed of corporations and their exploitation of people barely making enough to survive. I grieved for those who had been scarred and wounded, the refugees, immigrants, trafficked, abandoned, orphaned, falsely imprisoned. The world was so desperately broken and wicked, its oppressive cancer overbearing. I loved the Lord's creation in its intended light like genuine fellowship with good friends, the majesty of nature and its beauty, harmonious singing of a united people and passionate transformational art. But that was oh so rare and fleeting. And so this fire burned within me. What could I do? I refused to dance their tune, to simply accept the system. As a Lord of the Rings quote goes, what can men do against such reckless hate? The answer being, ride out with me and meet them. I decided, or perhaps was led, to apply to a prestigious college for the purpose of teaching the youth. I figured that was the best way to rebel against the corrupted establishment, bringing knowledge and hope to the next generation to pass on the torch for them to illuminate the future. The school I went to specifically specialized in preparing students for active vocational ministry. I would be trained for four years that I may be equipped to, in a sense, change the hearts of men and women towards truth and justice. And so I went, leaving behind my small town to the big city where my life would never be the same. It's hard to describe those first months at college, a whirlwind of new experiences to put it lightly, indescribable joys as well as harrowing lows. But I do not want to put the focus on what I did over the course of these four years for now, but instead shine a light on the individuals I met who would become an irreplaceable part of my life moving forward and the lessons they taught me. Just as Joker's strength was formed by the bonds he established, so was I. These were my confidants. The first member of the Boys in Black, the name for my friend group, was a man I'd known before I even went to college, for it was my brother, Jacob. 
by one and only brother. He is the most important person in my life. Always has been the number one guy I've looked up to. When it comes to intellectual questions or matters of morality, he always seems to know a profound answer and pushes me to be a more mature individual. Because of his abundant talents, both in physical as well as mental matters, I used to have an unhealthy inferiority complex trying to measure up to him. To me, he was this impossible mountain to overcome in order to prove my worth, a challenge that became burdensome, driving me to bitterness at my lack of comparability. Jacob finally confronted me on my unnecessary, damaging, and one-sided competition with him. This intervention was most likely spurned on by the fact that I struck him across the face in a complete lack of self-control, which was distressingly out of character for me. He sat with me for hours into that night, untangling the unseen thorns which strangled my heart, roots that grew deep into my childhood. Feelings of incompetence, neglect, bitterness, self-loathing, my unsaid perceptions that my family loved him more than me, that I would always be second place in their eyes, that I wasn't good at anything compared to him, so why even try? These perceptions of inferiority laid bare for the first time in my life, all thanks to his unquestionable care for his foolish little brother and his willingness to confront the cause of the conflict beyond the surface level. It was through Jacob's firm love that I began not to value my worth in comparison to others, that instead of rivalry, I could embrace friendship. He has been a constant guide in my life to higher thoughts and mature living, the most trustworthy and loyal, insightful and intelligent beyond anyone I've ever met. So if I had to link him to Persona, I would say he would be represented by the Hierophant Arcana. The Hierophant is a symbol of education, authority, conservatism, and obedience to the rules and relationship with the divine. The definition of a Hierophant is a person who interprets sacred mysteries or esoteric principles, and the term was originally used to name ancient Greek priests who did so. With that definition, it is quite fitting for my older brother, who taught me the complexities of the faith, the necessity of order, and the importance of authority to be represented as this role. Moving into the dorms of college was quite the different living situation that I grew up with. 30 guys on a floor, two per room, sharing a single large bathroom and communal area. Each floor had its own community and identity, it would dramatically affect your undergraduate years. The first guy I met on my beloved floor of Colby 11 was Julio. Julio is an incredibly diligent man, hardworking, intelligent, and caring. Though back in the day, his pride and lack of discretion could sometimes trip him up. Since I've known him, he has never stopped seeking his goals. He had to take the English exam test multiple times to come over from Italy for a college education because he kept failing, but eventually he overcame it. Balancing an intensive job, stellar grades, a relationship, meaningful time with friends, church, all while being in a new country, he really has been an inspiration to me since the beginning. Julio has been a witness to an all of my successes and failures since undergrad, and he's consistently encouraged me through it all. If I need another push amidst doubt, I know that he's there for me, always. Julio taught me that striving towards your lofty goals and ideas is not a fool's errand, but it does take serious work. It's possible that the only real hindrance is myself and my willingness to press on through failure. If I had to give him a confidant, it would be the Chariot Arcana. The Chariot Arcana is a symbol of victory, conquest, 
self-assertion, self-confidence, control, and mobility. Think old school shonen protagonists. The Chariot is all about forward momentum and never giving up. It is their strength as well as their folly. They are sometimes rash or egotistical, but also full of resolve and tenacity. Julio's ability to overcome all obstacles through serious, disciplined hard work easily makes him fitting for this role. My first roommate at college was mentally unstable. I tried my best to be a support he could rely on, but I could not compare to the professional help he needed. So my first semester was spent on pins and needles, low-key afraid to sleep in my own room due to his manic episodes. But then came my first friend of college into the picture, Jaime. Jaime would seek me out and strike up a friendship, bonding over art and Christian rap music. He often gave me respite from my tense situation. So I switched roommates the next semester and stayed with Jaime for the remainder of my years. Jaime's background could not be more different than my own. His father hurt his family in a tragic way and left them without a provider, thus forcing Jaime to grow up quickly and be the man for his many younger siblings. His mother was an immigrant and they did not live in ridges. Many times Jaime would give up his bed for a floor so that his siblings could sleep well. In spite of all this sorrowful circumstances, which I could never truly understand, he did not let bitterness overtake him, though one could sympathize if he did. Instead, he sought to be a pastor, one who could shepherd those in pain, to guide them towards healing and hope. The most profound thing Jaime taught me is by his example of relentlessly seeking beauty. Someone who is forced to endure the ugliness of this world, yet choose to chase and imitate its beauty. Overcoming strife and tears to reap joy. If I had to give him a comparable confidant, there can be no other than the Emperor. The Emperor Arcana are often male leaders or father figures, or both. Many times the Emperor character is troubled by something very personal and doesn't know how to deal with it. While at first this may be a bit strange of a choice, I do believe it is quite fitting. Jaime had to take that paternal role in his younger siblings' lives. Not only that, but he was also a notable leader in his church and also as an upperclassman at college. He would often take younger men under his wing, teaching and guiding them. One could say that he has played the very role in many people's lives that was denied him. Not only that, but a matured emperor figure is one that lessens his need for control and instead realizes that not everything can fit into neat boxes. Jaime's nuanced perspectives, paternal modeling, and positive masculine attitude makes no more fitting role than that of the Emperor. I was not a very sociable kid growing up. I believe this to have several causes, but the fact that I had to miss a large portion of first grade due to a severe injury might have had the greatest impact. Even upon my late arrival, I was bound to a walker and kept at arm's length from other children. The very few friends I did make came from their initiation towards me. But Ross? He was the first one I had the courage to open up to upon my own initiation. Some background on Ross. He grew up in a uniquely terrible situation. His father was a legitimate Nazi who tried to instill the evil ideology into his son hoping to make the next Hitler. He worked at desensitizing Ross by exposing him to horror and other things. To put it mildly, he was a reprehensible father. Eventually, Ross and his mom would escape the situation. And in spite of his father's influence, 
Instead of becoming a Nazi, Ross became an amazing Christian who sought to become a minister. How about that for grace, huh? Fast forward to college, me and my friends were discussing girl troubles in the communal lounge, and I saw him kept to himself reading a book. All it took was a simple question. Hey Ross, what do you think? And the rest is history. Trying to describe the man that is Ross is kind of hard, since he is quite unique. A man larger than life. Metaphorically speaking, but also literally, <laughs> sorry Ross, <laughs> full of vigor and exuding a natural charisma backed by infectious humor. That is the man most see. Sort of like a bright sun that shines whether you want it to or not. But there was another side to him. Ross was also a contemplative man. He reflected on his actions and how they affected others. He cared deeply for others and would earnestly listen to their problems, sometimes even offering his bros complimentary back massages. So you had this man of duality, loud and brash, yet quiet and soothing. He never made apologies for who he was and didn't ask for permission, unless it was warranted. It didn't matter what others thought. Ross was Ross. Take him or leave him. But you bet you'd be missing out on gold if you passed him by. He taught me that it's okay to be your genuine self. It's such a cliche, but for a guy who's always felt like he's lived in his brother's shadow, Ross was a living example of that advice and it was transformational to behold. If he had to be linked to a confidant, it would undoubtedly be the sun arcana. The sun symbolizes happiness, joy, energy, optimism, and accomplishment. Characters of the sun arcana almost always find themselves in terrible situations. The situations belying the underlying optimism present in nearly all of them. Also, as the sun arcana portrays accomplishment, some of these characters have deep thoughts about the meaning of life and managed to find their answers. Ross had a dark upbringing, yet still manages to be a beacon of bold light and infectious cheer. Coupled with his contemplative nature and acting as a wellspring of wisdom, there is no better role for him than that of the Sun Arcana. Cole was the first underclassman to join our little brotherhood consisting of Julio, Jaime, Ross, Jacob, and myself. A man of unbridled curiosity and a ferocious desire to learn. Always positive and hardly angry, even though he's often the target of many jokes. He's very sociable and loved by all, to the point that most people on campus knew him somehow. Inherently kind and super sacrificial. His only shortcomings are apparent in his lack of discipline and chronic anxiety. Some background on Cole is reoccurring theme among many of the boys. He grew up without a father before he tragically passed away early. But he had an encouraging mother who supported him as he branched out into many new experiences such as music, theater, and religion. Cole was admittedly sort of awkward and goofy, but once others got to know him, he turned out to be the best kind of friend. I really loved how he would actively engage in intellectual discussions with eagerness and humility. I'm often driven by spontaneous bouts of insight and passion, so having someone nearby willing to listen to you rant for like three hours past midnight was a blessing indeed. Though Cole may struggle a bit with self-confidence, he taught me how to be passionate about growing and learning new things and being okay with not knowing everything immediately. Hopefully his humility will continue to rub off on me. If I would link him to a confidant, it would be that of the Star Arcana. Aspects of the Star Arcana are hope, self-confidence, faith, altruism, luck, generosity, peace, and joy. All of these aspects shine in Cole so well 
so much so that I've never even met someone as generous as him. Though the one thing he is missing from that list is self-confidence. But perhaps that is just because he is still growing himself. I'm sure that if he continues his path, that his confidence will shine without turning into pride. Because he so embodies these ideas, I think there's no more fitting role for Cole than the star. David, but better known by his nickname, Stints, joined our group around the same time Cole did. A reserved man of few words, kind and steady, like a warm rock. He's diligent, discerning, and temperate. The least outgoing, but the most reliable to those whom he trusts. Stints is one seriously loyal and sacrificial guy. There was one occasion where he accompanied me on foot to get a coffee from Starbucks in the middle of the winter time at around 1 a.m. That alone would be enough to submit someone as pretty good. But he even went the extra mile when it came time to deliver said coffee to a girl I was crushing on at her desk job. Unfortunately, my courage stat was not high enough to walk through the door and follow through. So without any protest, the mad lad delivered it for me despite the obviously cringe awkwardness of doing so. Thus earning him the title of total bro in my book. Though Stents was as solid as you could get, he was not immune to struggles. Like myself, he seemed to suffer from mild depression or depressive periods, but he never let this hinder his considerate care for others, always being present to confide in. What I learned from Stints is to not wallow in my own struggles and neglect others, but to find healing in the act of helping others. If I had to link him to a confidant, it would be the Hermit Arcana. The Hermit is associated with wisdom, introspection, solitude, retreat, and philosophical searches. Hermit Arcana characters share the commonality of placing themselves in situations that hide them from the public eye. They tend to hide away from others or act in more supportive roles rather than putting themselves in the spotlight. I think this arcana describes Stintz's introverted yet lovingly supportive nature very well. Much could be said about Ethan, better known as Cash, a man of great complexity, hardworking, intelligent, and loving, yet sometimes lacking maturity, wisdom, and self-control. Constantly growing, constantly struggling forward. He was the last man to integrate into our brotherhood, but certainly not the least. We first connected through a disagreement that led to a debate, and then found a shared love for anime and video games. Finally, through shared trials and hardships, we bound together as brothers. I never really expressed it to him, but I admire Cash a ton. Though maybe for a strange reason. He seemed confident, yet had many insecurities. He was a diligent student and a hard worker, yet simultaneously lacked discipline. He was loyal and loving, yet sometimes spoke insensitively. To some, this would look like a contradictory man, but what it really was was a someone committed to growing, fighting, struggling to overcome their shortcomings. Out of all the boys, he most vocally hated his sin and would strive against it. It didn't matter how slow the actual results of the growing were, to see his efforts inspired me. The lesson I learned from Cash was to never be content with your shortcomings. Always fight for the change you desire. Even if you fall a hundred times, stand back up a hundred and one. If he was to represent a confidant, it would be the Magician Arcana. The Magician Arcana is commonly associated with action, initiative, self-confidence, immaturity, manipulation, and the power to harness one's talents. I think this is a fitting description due to it being a great description of Cash's battle against his weaknesses as well as his shortcomings. Constantly battling yet not quite honed as a mature warrior yet. To me, the Magician Arcana suits him well for now. 
Sophia, a woman of great love, especially for children, and a strong desire for peace in which everyone is included. Highly energetic and excitable, positive and encouraging. She was the only woman to join our group and was the youngest of us. To many, she was like a younger sister, and for a few of us, she happened to pull at the heartstrings. It would appear at first glance that her and I would be complete opposites. While I was oftentimes moody, combative, and introverted, she was cheery like a summer sun, valued harmony, and was quite sociable. But as we got to know one another, we found we actually were kindred souls in the things that we valued. Our friendship would blossom with me trying to help her grow in the matters of the mind, while she helped me grow in matters of the heart. Many times did she stretch my compassion and corrected my inconsiderations. Though she was a great blessing in refining me into a better man, she possessed a great struggle. Stuck between maturing and staying the same, she feared the kind of growth that hurts. Avoiding conflict at all costs, even when it was necessary. Because of this lack of conviction, this unwillingness to suffer growing pains, I fear for her. The reason why being demonstrated by the last man I will discuss. If I had to link her to a confidant, it would be the lovers. The lovers arcana represents the struggle of choosing between two paths in life. The reason for the name is due to it usually being depicted as a man having to choose between a young, beautiful woman or a mature, serious woman. Though really what's being illustrated is the choice between immediate satisfaction or the fruits of hard labor. My worry is that my friend is too prone to the former and that said path will only lead to emptiness. While the latter, though requiring commitment and sacrifice, will reap wholeness. This struggle is why I see her as the lover's arcana and that it's the right role for her. The last man left to discuss is the one who taught us all a harsh lesson. John came in alongside me as a freshman. He would quickly establish himself as a sort of leading voice amongst the community, having a naturally persuasive charisma. He gave off the impression of intelligence and would quickly dismantle any opposing viewpoints with machine gun arguments. Due to his sociable nature, he quickly became friends with most of us to varying degrees. But for me, he was someone I considered a brother. And this is why his betrayal cut as deep as it did. So deep that my heart bled anger instead of sorrow. It was years into our time at college when it was revealed that he had sexually assaulted someone on the floor. Not just someone, but my dear friend. It took an unbelievable amount of courage for this man to come forth to reveal this crime against such resistance. John immediately denounced the accusation and sent about spreading lies and slander to cover his sins turning most of the impressionable freshmen onto his side. I stood beside the vi victim openly and complied with the school investigation, trying to be a shield in any way I could for these malicious arrows being shot our way. It was not easy. I was beloved on the floor, seen as a leader. Now I was called a liar, a reviler, a fake Christian. I was shunned and slandered. This community that I loved and put my soul into nurturing had been divided by this one man's unwillingness to accept responsibility. Through these dark times, the boys bound together and became even stronger. Tempered in the fires, if you will. Not too dissimilar to how the Phantom Thieves did. Finding a place of belonging on one another we endured. But what became of the investigation against John? He was declared guilty. Not surprising, for the evidence was overwhelming. Countless testimonies and even official reports of misconduct. Guilty of sexual assault. But in reality, 
so much more. But what were the consequences? Nothing, really. He was allowed to stay at the college, even on the same floor, only a few doors away from the victims. An absolute pastoralization of justice. Perhaps it was due to him convincing the misled freshmen to write counter testimonies, or the fact he sold lies to some professors to back him up. Or maybe it was just sheer incompetence on behalf of the college administration. Whatever the cause, this villain was allowed to escape his crimes. Even the appeal we wrote up with additional evidence was denied a viewing. What a twisted joke. I had never been filled with so much righteous anger as I had during that time where your very bones burn with the desire to right the wrongs. If I was in a Persona game, it would be now that I would have awakened. But I also can't remember a time where I felt such fear. Locking my door at night, avoiding elevators if certain people were in them. But even in that darkness, I never felt such love as I had during that time. The support and loyalty of my true friends was like a beacon of light in a world of shadows. I learned so much during this time. Too much to say all now. But something key I learned from John was this. Refusing to change may end up destroying you and others as well. If I would represent John as an arcana, and I've been trying to avoid this, but it would be a mix between the tower and the devil. The tower is portrayed aptly as a tower stricken by lightning, from which two small figures fall down. A straight Tower of Babel allegory about pride preceding the fall. The tower arcana is commonly associated to overly arrogant, prejudiced and authoritarian organizations which walk to their own ironic demise. While the Devil Arcana is represented by the urge to do selfish, impulsive, violent things and being a slave to one's own impulses and feelings. You see, John had struggled with attraction to the same sex since he was a youth. Due to his faith, he tried to fight such temptations. At least, that was the impression he gave. In reality, he fed into those desires, letting them become even more distorted. Jokes became action. Twisted fantasies became reality. Because he refused to deal with his desires and change, he was overcome by them, and so he did great harm to others. Through countless warnings and rebukes, he persisted on his path of pride, leading to ruin. Despite such a harrowing experience with John, by the end of my time at college, I felt on top of the world. I had the best friends one could ever ask for. They were brothers to me. Their strength was my very own. I felt prepared to storm the beaches, so to say, ready to give truth to the next generation. I felt invincible and defiant, like I had everything figured out and the rest was going to be easy coasting. My passion burning stronger than ever, I was ready to totally commit myself to a cause and nothing was going to stop me. Unfortunately, life doesn't go that smoothly. I didn't get to graduate conventionally. COVID-19 hit and my last semester was cut short. I didn't get to say my goodbyes. I didn't get closure. I didn't get to hug my friends and make plans to keep us together. I didn't get to process actually graduating and leaving this place I called home, this place where I finally belonged. It was all snatched from me. I didn't even get to finally confess properly to the one who captured my heart. And so, in one sweeping motion, 
I was knocked off my feet and thrown into a chaotic and divided world. Because of the state of America at the time, finding a job in my field was impossible. Everything was uncertain. I was in isolation, all alone with no one nearby to lean on. I was so used to having my friends to confide in, to encourage me, to teach me, to walk with me. But now they were physically out of reach. I had trained so hard for four years to be a minister, but now all I could do was scrub toilets because church employment doors were closed due to economic uncertainty. I was so used to life being on a straightforward path with obvious steps, but now it was a void. And so my dark night of the soul would begin into the underworld I went. I was overcome by despair and doubt. I doubted I would ever get closure for those four precious years. I doubted I would ever get to see my friends again, laugh and cry with them. I doubted I would ever have friends as great as them again. I despaired because I didn't want different friends. I just wanted to be back with them. I doubted I would ever use the degree I labored four years for. I doubted I was ever capable of being a youth pastor. I doubted I would ever work a job with joy. I despaired at being a wage slave for years. I doubted that I would ever make my parents proud. I doubted I would ever get over the woman I loved. I doubted that I could even be loved. I despaired because I didn't want to move on. I doubted I would ever be a husband and a father. I doubted I, that I ever could be. I doubted that God heard my tears. I doubted that I even deserved to be heard. I stopped praying. I stopped crying. I just stopped everything. I wanted to die, to escape to heaven so that I wouldn't have to face such an empty future that looked like it would never change. I was drowning in despair over a loss that even getting out of bed seemed absolutely pointless. Everything was gray now, bitter, purposeless. So, being separated and eventually isolated, I didn't know what to do. I reverted back to my old, pitiful self. The one who hated who he was. The lonely, bitter, depressed boy. The boy who saw no reason to live merely for his own sake. So, I stagnated. Hating where I was and who I was, but unable to muster the motivation that I used to get from others to change my situation for the better. Just like Futaba, I had convinced myself that I was better dead, and so my room became my very own prison of regression. Every lesson I learned from my friends erased. All my passion and hope evaporated. Complete shutdown. Stagnation. Death and all but bodily function. This severe malaise would continue for some time. Eventually, through sheer willpower or perhaps just enough grace from God, I was able to muster up the strength to go to my parents for help. They did help. They helped me stabilize my mental state by setting me up with a job to at least start moving again, making tangible progress forward. They alleviated as many burdens as they could, but the gaping wound in my soul would be something only I could deal with. 
For years, I slowly tried to get better, to reignite my passion that was long gone, to see color and beauty like I used to, to dare and hope again for joy. But I must confess, I had only moderate success. With time, I no longer wished death, but I didn't really know why I lived. I tried to get further education in a bid to maybe be a professor someday. I thought I wanted to do that, but doubt creeped in. Feelings of incompetence and anxiety. Because of this, I decided to stop taking classes before I incurred further debt. It was in this state, after all that, that I stumbled upon Persona 5 Royal over the Christmas season. Man, do I love Persona games. The style, music, themes, gameplay, they are always amazing. But this one, this one hit different. Playing through it for over 150 plus hours, I saw so many things that reminded me of my own life. The Phantom Thieves, a bunch of misfits that suffered in some way due to adults and society. Finding a place of belonging with each other. Finding a shared passion for justice and changing the world to be a better place. I saw my boys and I. But I also saw my own inferiority complex in Akechi and Sumire. My own self-loathing in isolation in Futaba. My own idealism and desire to escape in Maruki. My pursuit of justice in the Phantom Thieves. Playing through this game, I watched and helped different characters overcome their personal struggles help them accept themselves, find new purpose, defeat evil. I watched their pain, their doubt, their confusion, betrayal, and victories. Like Ryuji, a star athlete turned despised outcast. He was physically marred, losing his dream because of it. His friends hated him and his teachers openly talked bad about him but he didn't give in to such a sad fate. He raised a flag of defiance and sought justice, not just for himself, but for others. He saved many people from hardships through his efforts, inside the metaverse and outside. He conquered his shame and reconciled to the track team even though there was great resistance. He found a place of belonging amongst people with shared values and grew to be a selfless hero. And in the end, he didn't give up on his dream and instead committed himself to rehab so that he could run once again. Though this would separate him from his beloved friends for a time. Or take Sojiro, a calloused old man who never really found much purpose in life and stuck to the status quo. Racked by guilt due to his inability to prevent the death of his dear friend, raising her daughter as his own, but completely lost at how to even be a good father, and troubled by doubts on if he even should be. I watched as this old man came to terms with his own deficiencies and faced his insecurities, finding purpose in something worth defending for for the first time in this found family he had been given in Joker and Futaba. Those are just two examples, but there's over 20 cases of this throughout the game. These characters, to put it simply, I watched them change. And it was inspiring and beautiful in a lot of ways. But when those credits ran, I realized that unlike them, I hadn't changed. I had not accepted myself, nor overcome my struggles. When great injustice happened in my life and those most precious to me, I simply raised my hands in defense. I didn't pursue the justice I so loftily held up. 
I let the pain, doubt, confusion, and betrayal break me down. For two years, I had closed my eyes to this. Now, in reality, I knew, but had simply resigned to my fate. I didn't petition for a different verdict. I didn't contact the police, but instead trusted in an apathetic administration. I didn't cause a scene and fight for justice at all. I didn't do enough. This is going to sound pretty stupid. I've been holding this all in for so long, just hiding it for myself. So please, help me kill every last one of my regrets. I gave up everything! Everything! So why? <laughs> why? Why, Ruby? A reality where no one suffers. Done. I get it now. All thanks to you. I couldn't accept it any longer. I will not accept it any longer. And so, I had to sit with my thoughts and heart for quite a while after I finished Persona 5. By all technicality, it was just a game. But in truth, it was certainly more. It was a narrative transformed into a mirror or challenge to the viewer, to me. Will you change? And to that, my answer was a defiant yes, followed by a quiet question of, but how? Who was I again? What did I stand for? Why did I stumble? How did I get here? All of these questions requiring honest, excruciating examination. I had to face my shadow, so to say. I am a son of loving parents, a brother to a genius and teacher, a friend to loyal and brave men a disciple of Christ, a man who loves beauty, who fights for justice, whose greatest joy is in helping others. I stood for truth no matter the cost, for self-sacrifice, for understanding, for faith. All of this my conviction, the beat of my very own heart. At college, I felt smarter, kinder, purposeful, confident, funny, and a lot of other things. I felt like I really belonged. And I strove to be all those things because of those around me. I wanted to be more for their sakes. It's what drove me and fueled my passion for living. But that was just my persona who I wanted to be, who I wanted others to believe me to be. 
So when my friends were gone, my persona broke to pieces. And so I stumbled because I was afraid. Afraid I'd never have a place to belong again. I stumbled because I didn't place value on my own life, leading to an unconscious belief that there was no reason to try and better my situation. I stumbled because I doubted. I didn't believe that I could truly accomplish any of my dreams, nor follow through on my conviction. I stumbled because I refused change. I was afraid because I didn't want to be alone again. I didn't value myself because I measured my worth to what society declared. I doubted because I didn't believe what I did had any value. I refused change because I didn't have faith. I didn't have faith in God, in my friends, or in myself. Some people prefer the original ending to Persona 5 over the Royals edition. And honestly, that's fair. It really depends on what theme you are leaning into. But for me, the sober ending of Royal was exactly what I needed. Of course, I wanted the Phantom Thieves to be inseparable and to go off into the sunset on one yet untold adventure. That's what I wanted in my own life. But that's not reality. Reality is a cycle of coming together and going apart. Greeting new people and saying goodbye to old friends. Nothing mortal lasts forever. Some say it's a cruel law of reality. And I used to silently agree with them. Why must I say goodbye? Why must friends be separated? Why must the pain of loss inflict us? It's really the whole dilemma of Maruki's false reality of apparent happiness. If I were presented with a choice to be reunited with the friends I had, having a vibrant job in my field, and reconciling with the woman I loved, would I really have the strength to deny it? No, because I prayed to God to give it to me all the while back while I was in my depression. I was completely debilitated for months. I desperately wanted a different reality, or at least the chance to redo those years of my life. I was very much like Sumire and Maruki. Sumire was the younger sister to a most exceptional gymnast. Always being second place would lead her into a deep depression and develop a inferiority complex. Despite the fact that her older sister and parents loved her greatly. This exactly mirrors my own life struggling to develop any ounce of self-worth, relying on others for basic direction in life. It was sad to see my own struggles from an outside perspective. And then Maruki, a genuinely good man who simply wanted to ease the pain of others, becoming trapped in his own grief, unable to move on from his loss, only desiring the escape of a different reality, rather than facing the one before him, burning with a bitter anger towards the unfairness of it all. But I see differently now, and with no small part due to Persona's influence. I now want to change to overcome, to accept and grow. I don't want to be trapped in this prison of self-pity over the things I've lost. I want to accept myself as having worth, 
to take measure of my worth based on what God says, not others or society. To believe that I can truly make a difference. I want to help people and I can't do that locked away. The only way things will get better is if I move forward one grueling step at a time, standing back up every time I fall and I will fall. Yes, what happened to me sucks, but so did the injustice that happened at college. But a beautiful brotherhood was birthed from that hardship. What can be birthed from this one? I have to strive to discover it. It makes me reflect on the old question. Why did God allow sin in the first place? There's really not a definitive answer. But there is one that's always struck my heart. Felix Kulpa, or fortunate fall. Because of Adam and Eve's fall, I get to experience the grace and redemption of Christ. I get to know mercy, incomparable love, resurrection, hope, faith that is affirmed, commitment, reconciliation, all of these magnificently beautiful things. Can one know the depth of redemptive joy if one has not known self-inflicted despair? I'm not sure, but it does seem that the greatest beauty comes from the most horrible ashes. Such is the cross, such is man. I think this is the same realization Yusuke had to discover when seeking how to capture the heart of man. I can't hold on to this idol I've made of my friends. It's due to an over-reliance on them that I hadn't needed to address these rooted issues in my life. We are going our separate ways. We must do so for all of us to grow. Of course, this doesn't mean they're gone from my life. Far from it. They will always be my brothers and welcomed near to me. The bonds we formed are eternal, ever with me and unbreakable. But we can't be together in the same sense as those four years. Not until we've all climbed to the top of the mountain and reunite in eternity. I can't keep holding on to this love I had. It's been years now, and still I hold on to an after image of her, a mirage, clinging to a memory instead of embracing the potential of the future. I must move on. It didn't work out. And that's okay. I can love again if I just keep my heart open to it and my head facing forward. I can't keep wallowing in my depression. I need to make changes. Some of them I've just started, like learning how to cook nice meals and not simply eating frozen pizzas. Chicken katsu ramen was my first dish and it was pretty good. And paella valenciana is my next one. I've started pursuing justice a bit more by working with my union for more fair working conditions. I'm putting effort into hobbies again, like producing this video and learning about jazz. I'm not there yet but I'm going to ease myself into socializing again, seeking to make new friendships where I'm at, through volunteering at church, for example. I'm going to start praying more intentionally and being honest about my depression with myself and those close to me. I'm going to move forward, no matter what, 
developing myself as a person and refusing to remain stagnant, captive to memories of the past. I am going to change. This video is a sort of calling card to myself to not forget this conviction, to follow through on my change of heart, even if I stumble again. Having faced this small taste of memento mori, this little death, now it's time to carpe diem, to seize the day. This video has already been uh, a little too long, so I think the best way to summarize it is with the very words of Persona 5's opening. It's time to... Wake up, get up, get up there. When we were young Trying to find where we belong Never thought those days would see
Thank you. 